Welcome. This video is all about Drupal. And what we're going to do is compress a five hour job down into as short a time as possible. Uh, what I've done is I've got a video um, taken in a number of separate sessions and I've doubled the speed. So um, I'm not a, that fast a typist or, or that fast a, a mover of the mouse. Uh, just bear in mind, I'm compressing this down so that it's into a, a watchable, uh, consumable, um, uh, digestible piece. Now, wh what I'm doing here is I'm just going to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about the specification of the, um, the application that we're building in Drupal here. And I I'm doing this using a... Um, a drawing tool called draw.io. Uh, you can see the URL at the top. And I'm using the UML tool set um, to describe a few different diagrams, this one specifically being um, a use case diagram. And I'm listing out my actors. So I've got a person who does surveys. I've got a person who creates um, a batch of cupcakes as it turns out. So we're going to create a cupcake survey system and uh, a baker is going to be involved in baking the cupcakes obviously and, and submitting those cupcakes for review. But the baker themselves can't uh, allow that batch to be uh, approved for uh, surveying until the chef has tried it. Um, the chef can also um, submit survey, um, submit batches for survey, um, but uh, a baker can bake and request um, a survey, but a chef has to approve that. And finally, both those two users, the uh, baker and the chef, both have the um, dubious honor of being able to look at the surveys that were submitted by our surveyor. Um, so in, in theory, what, what we've got are some customers, uh, so those customers are involved in um, obviously eating the product, but also uh, they are invited to um, partake in some kind of a feedback of, of the qualities of, of that product. And I'm, I'm making it crystal clear here which actors have access over which uh, use cases. So for example, um, a baker shouldn't necessarily do surveys um, and a chef shouldn't do surveys, e even though uh, as far as Drupal is concerned, um, those surveys will be submitted anonymously. So anonymous users are allowed to create um, a special survey um, and uh, there I'm looking to just enclose our um, use case diagram in some kind of a, a box, a frame. And that frame will get a title. So the title of our system is a cupcake survey system. Um, and uh, CSS for short. So, um, so that's the end of the first diagram. And it's a 10,000 foot view of, of the kind of feature sets that we want to include in our site. The second diagram, well, I'm taking a screenshot, obviously. I want to save that uh, for reference, and I'll include that in the, um, in the Drupal application, and we'll just call that uh, CSS use case. Um, but we, we want to move on to the next stage, and that is to um, describe uh, the data that will be held in our system. So another UML diagram that's very handy is the um, class diagram. Now, of course, Drupal is an object-orientated system, but we're not going to do any coding. Um, but it might be useful just to formalize the kinds of information that our information system is going to store and, and represent to, to users. So there are two objects or, or two types of information, and, and they are related. There's a core relationship between them. Um, the batch describes the cupcake and all its features, uh, and the survey is going to be on one of the batches that um, has been approved. Um, so I'm just listing all of the uh, core features of, of, let's say, a cupcake. So when it was baked, uh, what it, the superlatives around what that, that cupcake is all about, including images and any HTML that you want to embed into that text field. 
Um, paper color, icing flavor, and sponge flavor are both, um, you know, uh, determining factors, and that will help the surveyor identify which cupcake they just ate against uh, a list of batches that had had already been um, approved for surveying. So we're going to take um, four pieces of statistical evidence and one qualitative piece of evidence. And I'm not sure whether I've even included the string that represents comments. So um, I might have overlooked that. But you can see the survey has a time that took place and the kind of data that, that's occurred. And, and what I'm attempting to do now is to draw a little line between those two because the first option on survey is the batch choice of object batch. So uh, I'm trying to use uh, UML diagrammatic tools which are object orientated, things like Java and C++ uh, programmers tend to use UML quite heavily. Um, and I'm, I'm shanghaiing that into sort of formalizing the meaning of, of, um, of, our, of our system, even though we, we technically won't be using methods just the two objects with that, their data types. The third is a, a, another UML diagram, which is called the interaction diagram. And I'm going to list out the four objects that represent the pieces of data as they flow through our system. And then describe um, sequentially the, the kinds of um, flows that occur during the life cycle of, of those objects. Um, so the first two objects will be the survey, and the second two, sorry, the first two objects will be the um, the batches. And, and you'll notice I, I've I've already um, made a mistake. I, I'm about to to uh, um, fall into the same trap that I've just described. Um, and the baker and the chef are involved in the creation of the object called um, batch. Uh, but that batch to go from draft to published requires a um, a chef, and you can see here I'm I'm incorrectly using the word survey. I, I sort of resolve that problem in my head as as I go through the creation of this interaction diagram. So the flow um, vertically from top to bottom is time. So o over time. Uh, the object moves from draft to published, uh, and and there are actors that are involved in in moving that object through that slot through its life cycle. Um, the second two objects on the right hand side represent the survey, and the surveys are done on uh, batches. So here I am fixing my uh, little faux pas. Um, so the survey never gets published. That is, it's never open to the public. It's one of those things that only uh, our chef and our um, baker are going to use to continually improve their product. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that I'm going to draw some more lines to the right. So uh, to the right are the life cycle of, of the... Um, of the uh, the objects and vertically down is the time span and you'll notice that I'll I'll, um, I'll have an arrow pointing back that represents once the surveys are in the chef uh, and the baker will will uh, benefit from from that data so um, there is definitely a um, a, a a feature that um, needs to be thought about. So I, I do the interaction diagram when it's not clear in the model, that, that is the use case diagram or the class diagram, about the way in which the site functions. And, and this makes it explicit as to um, really what, what's going on with our system. Um, and that uh, that's sort of the end of the uh, the the planning stage. Um, so I'm going to sort of export this file out and include it in my planning document. I'll, I'll have taken screenshots and whatever else, so, so that it's all pretty clear as to. Um, and then every and if, excuse me, if anyone else um, takes up the uh, the job of implementing this site, um, they're never in any doubt as to uh, exactly what. Um, 
what the project entails. In fact, you could take some of these diagrams directly back to the client to confirm the feature set of the site and, and the processes by which we would go about its implementation. So uh, what I'm interested in doing now um, that the diagrams have been created is, is to actually look at the finished site. So in hindsight, um, uh, we still have a number of <laughs> Uh, an hour and a half together at least. We're 10 minutes into the video and, and I'd like to take you through what is the finished site and just go through that life cycle to explain to you what's happening with the site. So I've logged in as Baker and I can list the surveys that are in. I can list all of the cupcakes that have been published and I can create my own cupcake batch uh, and that is uh, going to be... Um, an item that won't appear on the uh, list of possible surveyed um, cupcakes until the uh, chef has approved it. So I'm going through and um, instead of actually baking a cupcake and taking a photo of it, I'm going to <laughs> use the uh, powers of the internet to um, pretend. So I've taken a, an image and I'm going to just drop that straight into our, um, our site and um, that can be the um, the one item that was was created. So it will be a citrus flavored uh, cupcake with a yellow paper. So um, so you you see there it's in its unpublished state. It's not in the published state, and and we want to get it from its unpublished to its published. Um, the baker can make alterations or delete that, um, but they won't bring that to survey until the chef has logged in and, and had a look. So you can see here there is no lime, uh, no lemon uh, uh, or citrus uh, cupcake. So now that I've logged in, you can see here there's my, um, my opportunity to move the uh, moderation state or, or the workflow from, from its, um, its uh, what do you call it, uh, unpublished to its published state. So, so now you can see a history of the revisions that have been made on that piece of content and now it has moved from the unpublished to the published state. Um, and uh, and that, that seems to be the, the, the resolution. Now um, I've made a configuration er error. Um, that lemon lime does not appear in survey because I've not made a configuration correctly. I think I need to quickly log in as admin and go into the views section and actually change the um, the caching uh, options in, in views because if something changes in views we, we don't want the cached version. Um, so going back to our, our logged out state you can see now that my lemon lime bliss is on the list and, and I can choose from the uh, statistical ratings and then leave some kind of comment at the end. Um, as an anonymous user I can't see the, um, the surveys that have come in. I'll need to log in as either a, a cook or a chef and then you'll see the surveys that have appeared. This is a rather simple table format. Um, we could probably get some kind of graphing uh, solution together that, that would show that information. But uh, at this stage, we, we, we're getting the information system together. And this is, this is the completed application to take to the client. So now we're moving um, to the beginning of, of the process of implementation. So 13 minutes into the video, I've explained the uh, specification. I've shown you what our finished solution looks like. And now I'm going to install the software um, from scratch. So uh, essentially, I'm, I'm downloading a copy of Drupal, the current 8 tree, version 8. And I'm pulling down probably the 10 or 11 most popular plugins um, or, or modules that extend the functionality of Drupal. I didn't use any of them in the creating of the site except for some admin modules. So um, you may see me download and install these modules, but, but they, they weren't technically used. Um, the two modules that are very useful when you're working with um, with a site is, is the admin toolbar. So we've just pulled down um, the admin. We're racing through development and entity reference and 
um, a, a, a few developer friendly um, and user f f user layout friendly modules, but most of those are, are um, useful to look at uh, and get an idea for um, the kinds of things that Drupal will be in the future. The one of the uh, admin toolbars that um, I've found useful is is to have uh, a spotlight spotlight like interface, which uh, is the coffee. Um, uh, module. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to go through and pull, uh, extract out and install Drupal into the public HTML folder and prove out that um, that URL exists. So we have uh, the beginnings of our installation. We've got to change some of the uh, permissions on the uh, on the server that we're in at the moment. Now um, I'm got a version of uh, Apache and MySQL running on this local host. Uh, the machine is pretty um, pretty quick, so uh, not not only is, is it fast at 1-1 one, one speed, but when we uh, double the speed in, in, in what's happening here, um, things happen a little bit qu quicker. What I'm doing is I'm changing the uh, permissions in the writable areas of the um, of the system. So I've got to create a settings folder, permiss that settings folder in a way that uh, the Drupal install will, will work. Another thing that uh, is a, a bit unusual about Linux generally is, is that it, it has a, uh, a further security level beyond just file permissions and this is uh, called SE or Security Enhanced Linux. Um, and it's a, a put a watch on uh, on the Apache or HTTPD in this case writing to file system. So I, I've got to tell the kernel of the operating system that yes, it's okay to write these files. Um, Apache is allowed. So so not only do we have to change the permission of the folder in a traditional sense, but we also have to tell the uh, the server um, in a security enhanced way. So I've uh, pasted in the um, security level uh, complaints, and and uh, I'm just uh, checking that the uh, the information that we've uh, unzipped is is in the right place. Um, and I think the second line, which is uh, restore con, um, which is to enable that. Um, that permission, so I'll just paste that straight in, uh, hit the enter key, and uh, we should now uh, clear the error, and now uh, we're able to put in the database. Before we um, we actually name that database, we should create one here in PHP My Admin. It's able to be done on the command line, but sometimes PHP My Admin's quicker. So Drupal is the database name, root is the username, and there is no password. So in this uh, local host environment, we're um, free of, of some of the security constraints. Uh, we'll, when we send this up to a server, we'll have to have more secure passwords. So now that I've got the database created, I'm creating the first user of the system, so the admin user, and I'm defining their location, and I'm telling the system not to check for updates. So this now is Drupal installed, writ large, um, and we have uh, all of the settings of um, version 8.2x installed but what I'm doing is I'm installing the admin toolbar and I need to enable the admin toolbar and the um, the search utility coffee um, and that will then allow me to have a slightly more advanced to drop down menu system that I can navigate quicker to the exact place uh, in in the admin area the uh, the link uh, in the black band at the top go to shows a little text field where you can start typing in things. So if you if you're looking for content types or, or um, creating new pages, then then by by all means. So the first thing I'm going to do is create the welcome page, which is the home page, and I want to set it as the home page. So I'll go to basic site settings and change from a view to a static page. So um, in, in that respect, what we've done there is is just defined the home page to be uh, a specific place. Uh, so 
um, I've got two browser windows open now. I've got one where I'm authenticated as admin, and I've got another window where I am unauthenticated. And I like to have the two windows open at the same time so that I can see um, both views, both the, the, the end user view. And that, that's usually sort of a bit of a clean room view. I, I, I don't have any extra um, complexities around the admin toolbar itself. So um, I'm just picking up the last couple bits of uh, modules. Um, so I need Bootstrap, which is a, a theme. Um, and the Bootstrap theme is a minimalist developer theme. Um, and it uses the uh, the Bootstrap layout engine. Now, I can't install it directly. I need to actually create a sub-theme, and, and that's what I'm doing here, is I'm going to the command line, and I'm going to copy out a folder inside um, the Bootstrap theme, which is a starter kit. And that starter kit is a... Um, uh, a um, a sub a sub section of of the entire site so or the theme itself so i can upgrade the theme but all my configurations all of my customizations will be in a separate folder and and uh, configured in a separate way and i'm just going to follow verbatim the six steps that you see here on the screen and i'll highlight them just so that as i work through them i i, um, I know that they're done so i've made the starter kit theme in a new folder but now i've got to rename files and directories so anything with the capital t-h-e-m-e n-a-m-e -E, i've got to rename name to my new folder which uh, my new file name which will be uh, something like cupcake underscore bs so uh, which is short for bootstrap not what you might think it is so um, all of the files that um, I'm currently using that have theme name in them I'm, I'm just moving to a new place I'm also going to have to edit some of these files uh, just to ensure that those um, new directory folder names and file names are, are enshrined in configuration also. And what that does is it allows me to enable this sub-theme sub um, directly in the uh, user interface. So um, there's a few steps and it's important to read the readme because um, the theme contains a number of pieces. It contains CSS which is obviously the first step you you would go to if you were going to change the look and feel of a site. But it also complains, uh, sorry, contains templates, and those templates uh, define the layout of pages, where blocks will go and where footers are, are constructed. And if you have to change something or you might want to add something um, to your site, editing those templates will be necessary and and it's necessary in this case to lay out the page in in a, a more more beautiful way and we'll get to that um towards the end of the video where um most of the um last half hour of this video is is dedicated just to hacking css and tweaking those templates so i, I do edit the main template and if you want to scrub all the way towards the last half hour and it's just css you want to check out then by all means but in the intervening time we're going to focus on on building the functionality um and as we work through that functionality i'll, I'll slowly fix certain parts of of the look and feel so uh, you might find some intertwining layout issues that I uncover as I'm, I'm working through the functionality of the site. So I'm just reading through all the little warnings and complaints. And if I hit refresh now, you should see that Cupcake BS that I'm now installing as a, as a, um, a core theme. Now if I hit the refresh key, the whole site changes. The whole theme has now been completely changed. Um, and I, I want to confirm in my mind that that theme not only has been enabled, but also when I edit some of the CSS, um, that will change also, uh, which it doesn't do without a couple of tweaks, a couple of configurations. So I'm madly hitting uh, refresh here. Uh, one trick is to hold down control shift refresh. Um, and that sometimes gets the browser to call the latest version. So I'm just 
checking my CSS, making sure that's not erroneous. I'm opening up my developer toolbar, checking that I've got my body laid out correctly. Um, but you can see here um, that new background still hasn't been allocated in the, the body selector. So I've, I've actually got to go back to the admin panel um, and actually change the configuration of, um, of Drupal itself. So not only have I changed body, but I've also changed the H1, the welcome there to an olive green, just, just to be 100% sure that when I do change my configurations that things will go good. So if you have a look at development, the first thing I want to do is turn off that aggregation. So uh, you don't want to aggregate. That, those are for, for um, speed related issues. Um, so once I've cleared the cache and I've turned off aggregation, my new CSS file is working fine. So I've got the light blue and the olive green all working uh, correctly. So I should be able to start doing some continuous improvement as I work through um, the functionality of the site. What you see, uh, because we're in Australia, there's a um, obviously a, a date reconfiguration. And, and if you're in Europe, um, then there would be an issue with, with your configuration, or Asia for that matter, because um, uh, the default seems to be set to the United States with um, month, day, year. So I'm, I'm going through all of the um, default um, date formats and just reverting them from month, day, year to day, month year. There's a whole lot of others, but I'm hoping that those first three, the defaults, um, should should suffice. Uh, I do actually add another later on in the video to remove the hours and the minutes. So there, there, may, there is some view situations where it may be necessary for you to change date format and then use your own customized format of date. So this uh, red area here shows all of the modules that I downloaded, and I think in turn I'll just uh, extract them out into the Drupal environment and, and enable some of them. So for example, Chaos Tools and, and uh, Path Auto are, are quite handy for, um, for extra uh, features in, in, um, in the site. So what I'm going through now is I'm enabling some of the modules that are built in, core modules, and then some of the experiment modules, experimental modules. Um, specifically, the one that we're going to use will be workflows. So the, that's the last one down the bottom that I'm just about to tick here. If you're in a multi-language environment, you might want to choose some of the uh, multilingual modules, but in this case, I won't. Um, so I, I've... Yeah, Path Auto is not too bad because you can set a, a friendly URL uh, when you create your static pages. So I'm, I'm just extracting out. You can see here, see tools, tests, token tests, and, and they will all represent um, different pieces of, of um, modularity. So Path Auto needed an extra module. So I'm, I'm hitting the... Um, I'm hitting the, the internet to find uh, that one more module that, that I need, um, which I think is actually a built-in module. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's actually here some, as downloadable one. Uh, double check. So path is installed, ctools is missing, and if I just um, update and then go down to path auto and splay that out, that, that seems to work. So... Um, I should be able to, yeah, Chaos Tools, and Path Auto should work fine. So, uh, there is an error at the top, uh, that relates to security. Um, and, and quite often when you have these installations, uh, eventually, um, your site will realize that it's not the latest version. And that's a whole other procedure to uh, update your, your Drupal site when it, uh, it uh, falls behind in security updates. Um, and, and a safe way of doing that as well. So, so I, I've just taken the site into maintenance mode. I'm going to do a sort of a, a quick backup of the site just so that if anything goes really wrong in, in starting my configuration, I, I won't lose the work that I've done so far. So it's a little bit like saving a Word document or saving an Excel spreadsheet. 
um, we're just going to uh, quickly back it up. And I'm looking at the error because um, it says trusted host settings. There's a setting that you can change in settings.php to tell the Drupal system to only listen to domain requests on a certain um, uh, certain domain. So uh, you don't want uh, your site to pretend to be any other sites. Um, and this, this is to resolve a cross-site scripting issue. In fact, this, is, this will be broken when I change it from example.com to localhost. So localhost is, is the domain from which this site will be hosted is, um, in its development stages. But if it's taken up onto the internet, I'm going to have to change that settings file to make it work properly. Um, so all I'm doing is just cleaning out any errors that, or any sort of gotcha errors that appear at the top of the um, of the admin panel, which which can just be a bit disconcerting when you see them. So we've pretty much got our uh, site set up. We've got our theme. We've got some modules. Uh, now we can go into the process of creating some content. Now that content will need to be in certain specific formats. So like we said in the um, in the planning, we're going to have to create two new content types. And those content types will be along the lines of um, a survey and um, a, uh, a batch. I'm sorry, uh, the MySQL dump file uh, command that I've just executed was to back up the site. So I've put the site into maintenance mode, cleared the caches, and I'm just quickly backing it up so that, that I, I don't have any um, any uh, boo-boos uh, going forward in, in my content creation. In fact, I, I can keep that um, to an, you know be a little bit further ahead of, of, of installations in the future. Um, so what am I doing here? I'm, I'm managing my blocks, and blocks are a way of um, laying out certain pieces of content, um, such as header and footer and sidebar. And all I'm doing is I'm cleaning out pretty much the sidebar from the, uh, the environment, and I'm dragging some of the materials or, or disabling some of the materials from, from the site. So... Um, the little piece of advertising that says Drupal I've pulled out. I'm putting search right up the top into the navigation. Powered by Drupal can go and get lost and removed. Every time I remove something, um, I realized that I hadn't saved the drags that I'm making. So I, I can drag changes around, but I have to remember to save them um, because they, if, without saving, they, um, they, they, they won't stay into the system. So let's create our first content type. So we're going to create a batch, uh, and a batch will be cupcakes that have been baked by a baker or a chef. Um, and we just need to have data um, going into those content types um, that are um, going to look like the pieces of data that we planned upon. So for example, I need the date that the cupcake was baked. Um, that's not the date this piece of content was created because that's a piece of metadata that, that, is that is attached to this content when it's created. So it might transpire that we made the cupcake late last night, so we have to put yesterday down as, as our, our date baked. And I'm, I'm making sure that um, the date baked is going to be... Um, you know, a date and not a date time. So we're only interested in the day that the cupcake was baked, not, um, you know, whether it was two in the afternoon or two in the morning. So one thing about um, uh, Drupal that makes it uh, pr pretty powerful is, is that you can define workflows. You can define the way in which data is created and transition from different states. So I'm playing around with transitions, and, and I'm, I'm just sort of uh, describing two types of um, uh, workflows and two different transitions in each one of the workflows that represent the way in which both surveys and um, batches are going to be handled. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I need to 
define in that content types configuration how uh, moderation is handled. So moderation and workflow are, are, are used interchangeably in, in this site. So I, I've defined the way in which that data will be modif uh, moderated, i.e. the workflow from uh, Baker to Chef, um, i.e. from a uh, draft to a published state. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm uh, making sure that um, the content type has a couple of drop-down lists that represent the flavors of both the icing and the sponge. And the this information is common between those two pieces of data. So the flavor of the icing and the flavor of the sponge could be the same or they could be different, but they're pulled from the same pick list. So what we're doing here is we're creating a vocabulary or a taxonomy to store that information. And we can then use that taxonomy throughout the content management system, um, i.e. different content types could have the same taxonomy. And if I wanted to add an extra flavor, I don't have to go to two content types or two fields to, to change that taxonomy. Uh, I can just go to that source configuration um, of taxonomy. So uh, I'm trying to think of all of the different um, flavors that we could go into a cupcake. Barring, of course, um, you know, hot chili peppers or um, garlic. And there's the list there of that taxonomy. So I want to go back into my content types and add the field that uses the taxonomy. So um, you can see that I'm renaming um, flavor to a more specific uh, icing flavor. Um, and that icing flavor is going to have um, the taxonomy that was, was created um, separate to, to the, uh, the content type itself. I'm having all kinds of trouble spelling at the moment. And there's the flavors choice of my taxonomy, but uh, I'm going to create two. I'm going to create the sponge flavor and the icing flavor, and hopefully I'll get that U out of there before I hit the submit button. There we go. Um, and, and I'm going to use exactly the same taxonomy that I used for icing flavor. And I need to tell it, instead of autocomplete, to pick from a total uh, number of options. So by default, um, it's an autocomplete. I type uh, C for chocolate, and chocolate comes up. But instead, I, I want a drop-down list that, um, that uh, appears. So um, I, I thought that a second taxonomy might be useful to describe the, the color of the paper that would be used in the cupcake. Again, you know, you, you, you're probably making a little bit more work for yourself in the first instance um, to maybe save some work in the future. So if, if you spend the time setting up taxonomies, it might come back to you in, in saved time when it comes to configuring um, more pieces of, of the content management system's uh, features uh, against that core taxonomy. So again, I'm, I'm not using flavors this time. I'm using the paper color and changing autocomplete to a select list. Uh, I can define layout. That's uh, one of the external modules or one of the, the plugin modules that, that I think is in the experimental area of, of Drupal itself. And you can see here I, I am creating or just going through the throes of creating a piece of content that... Um, uh, that will contain the, um, uh, the the information that I've configured. So I'm, I'm, I'm dipping out to the internet and just grabbing the first cupcake that I see uh, using my uh, uh, clipping tool or my uh, select tool to marquee out um, a piece of a cupcake and uh, just including it in this uh, site itself. So I can go to my pictures and add a cupcake. I need, need some alternative text and then saving it into the content. So that doesn't really achieve an outcome um, in terms of workflow because we haven't configured either the users or permissions or workflows 
properly yet. I'm just proving out that the um, the, the site actually creates a content type. And you note there that I've come to the realization that that particular date format system is not good enough because it's showing hours and minutes as uh, as a feature of, of the, the output. So I'm uh, dipping down to the date and time to create a new date format based on an existing one. So I'll take the default short date um, and paste in uh, everything except for um, that without any time. So uh, I end up with... Um, the default short date redefined to be super short. And I should be able to then go into my um, configuration again and change date to no time. Uh, have a look at that content and the time has taken or has been taken away. I don't like the lack of um, padding between the two columns. So I've got an image on the left and, and I think I've defined it to be on the left. Um, so that would be float left. So I've just added some padding around the image. That might come back and bite me um, if there are other images used on the site. But for the moment, we'll we'll uh, we'll move forward with that. So we've got a content type. Uh, we've got a taxonomy. We've got uh, a one piece of content uh, based on that. What I need to do now uh, is to list all of uh, the cupcake batches in a view and uh, a view can be a query uh, a query of the system to ask show me all of the that follow these criteria so uh, this is the shortest sweetest happiest view that I've created which just says show me all of the uh, cupcake batches now um, I'm, I'm trying to debug this at the moment because no batches came up and I'm wondering whether the workflow is at fault because the batch is in an unpublished state. And by default, the view is only going to show batches that have been published. So there may be a shortcoming in the way I've set up my, my, um, my workflow because there is no way in which I'm able to change that workflow from a draft to published. So I'm going back to, to check... Uh, my survey approval process and I'm going to simplify things down such that there are only two states and I need to move from draft um, to publish so I'm just well I think I'm going to delete them initially and and simplify everything down so that I only have two states and I create new two new workflows so I want to move from draft to published as a workflow um, and that's pretty much it so now I should be able as admin anyway to change the workflow from draft to published so now I, I've have that piece of content published and you can see here in my view that content appears nicely now um, I still haven't gone through the the permissions of that workflow obviously the admin that I'm using here has God mode um, it's allowed to do anything but uh, I'll need to sort of define a chef's role in being able to take a piece of content from um, draft to published now that I've created the view the view has a link the view has an address I can paste that in um, uh, I can define the title. I forgot the, the uh, prefixing slash there. And you can see here it's now a link that can be clicked on in the in the main menu. And I'm going to do that for a couple of views and a couple of add content types. So when I add a survey or when I add a batch, I need a menu item for it. When I list batches in draft or I list batches in published, I need a link for that also. So the menu system will be integral, and I'm going to manually configure those uh, as I see fit. I'm having a bit of a scratch around looking at, um, what do you call it, uh, fav icons. I'm searching for the fav icon. I've downloaded a, a cupcake at some point, and I can't seem to locate it. But I'll find it on another computer and, and go through the, the installation there, because these um, fav icons are... Um, you know, indigenous to, to Drupal itself. And a fav icon, if you don't know, is that uh, blue head that appears in the top of all of the tabs of that of my browser at the moment. 
Uh, I've got a lovely little uh, pixelized cupcake that I want to replace it with. And the same will go uh, with a, a SVG image that will replace the B, the purple B in Bootstrap for um, for a cupcake. We'll get that in eventually. Um, so I'm having a fiddle with a new content type. So we're working on the survey side of things now, and and survey will consist mainly of of um, data, statistical data from. 1 to 10, so 1 being the worst, 10 being the best. So I'm going through the four different um, uh, features of, um, you know, cupcake flavor, cupcake presentation, icing flavor, um, overall taste, and just defining a, um, a, a, a range from 1 to 10 on, on those those different statistical features. And as I said before, um, if you're going to save these as, as um, numerals or, or uh, numbers specifically, um, it, it then is possible for you to maybe graph out uh, overall um, uh, answers and, and get some statistically significant um, information from, uh, from building the survey system itself. So I'm going through each one of those four, pasting in that 1 to 10 list and um, just labeling things uh, so that they're they're clear for anyone else who might come along. Some of the information I'm putting in here might not be viewable by end users. If you mouse over some of these, you might see them as, as uh, mouse over uh, information um, in the forms as you fill them out. Um, so I'm repasting in these dates so that uh, sorry these uh, numbers so that we have um, sort of a, a clarity for the end users to know that one is poor and ten is fabulous just so that they're pretty clear on what that range is. I don't want to try and sort of uh, presuppose what people are going to put in, but nonetheless uh, it's useful to uh, to tell the user what one is. Uh, as opposed to what 10 is. I'm continuing to play with, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, workflows here, because I know that um, the the actual survey um, is, is never going to go into the published state. So I'm, I'm going to enshrine that and enforce that by defining a workflow that ensures that that, that content never gets published. Um, it's... A, a cheaty way to ensure that that content never gets out to the rest of the world. Um, there may be better ways, um, both in permissions um, and you know maybe uh, user roles. But um, uh, we'll we'll just go straight up with um, with defining a workflow. So um, we we pretty much have that content type done, and I'm changing the. Um, uh, the layout of the look of the form just so that it, it sort of scrubs up a little bit better um, and uh, we uh, make sure that the order of, of information appearing both at form and at uh, output um, doesn't look so so ugly um, and uh, we have the comments at the end rather than the top uh, and I'm making another view um, so the the batch history um, is is one view, but we need an, another set of uh, views which include showing the batches that are not published. Um, we need a, a another view to create a a relationship between the uh, survey and the um, the batch itself. So. There will be a few other views to create. We'll spend a bit more time in views as, as time goes on. But that survey content um, is just being beautified a little bit and, and cleaned up to make sure that um, we we have navigation ability to the create survey, the show batches, the show surveys type pages. So we're, we're tending to grow out our... Um, our uh, our menus and you'll find that in certain situations those menus will not show if the user doesn't have permission to see them 
So you'll, you'll find that uh, I start playing with um, content types. So for example, I'm going to be uh, careful and, and make sure that um, the user has the ability to do things. So the one piece of uh, uh, permission is to give anonymous users the right to put in a survey. So there's that content type and I've submitted a survey and hopefully if I look at my my content, I, I now have a new survey that's been created. I'm just changing again the order of things and trying to push out the size, but of course the um, the uh, bootstrap template won't let me do that. Um, I, I've got to go in and sort of override some of the behaviors of, of, um, of the layout engine that, that are, are squashing um, my site's ability to change size of, of forms. So I'm creating new users, um, or roles in this case. So I've got two roles, a baker and a chef. They'll both have the same user name. So I'll create a, a test user called um, chef and a test user called baker. But at this moment in time, I'm going through and configuring their rights to access different content. So the chef have obviously has a, a lot more rights over batch than does the baker. So the baker can edit some of their own stuff, but they certainly can't... Um, can't delete or, or bring some of that, that content to published. And there's another area for that under workflows or um, yeah transitions that would, that need to be handled. Um, and it's the same with survey. Uh, we don't want anyone to edit the survey in any way whatsoever. We, we just want users to create or anonymous users to create new drafts. So I'm creating my chef and I'm creating my uh, baker. Uh, and you'll note that down the bottom there, I'm going to change the role so that that, that particular user uh, inhabits the role. And I'm, I'm putting, you know, very insecure passwords in, but they just prove out a concept. Um, so I've got two users under the two new roles. Um, and if I go incognito or, or use a completely new browser in this case, so I've got uh, Chrome on one end and Firefox on the other, I should log in as Baker. Except this account Baker doesn't seem to have the permission set correctly. Um, there is a, a missing submit button from the, uh, uh, the user interface. So I'm in Firefox at the moment, and, and I'm just having a look at the uh, HTML CSS just to identify whether the form actually has a submit button in a in hidden, hidden way, um, just to identify whether it's a styling issue or, or whether um, it, it's actually a configuration issue. So I've gone back to the admin area, and I'm double-checking my permissions because, um, you know, while the user may have the permissions to create a batch or edit a batch or delete a batch. Um, it, that user can't bring um, workflow into draft or published. Um, and there is actually another area that relates to workflow further up that um, talks about um, bringing... Uh, the item from different states of of um, of public publication. So um, you can see here there is um, a transition um, permission that I need to set. So um, in order for the um, the batch to uh, actually be submitted. I've got to cr be able to create a new draft. So both Baker and Chef should be able to create a new draft, but only um, only uh, Chef is allowed to bring that um, transition to, to a published date. So um, there are others that are related to the survey that I'll need to configure later, but I'm, I'm hoping that that particular um, configuration change uh, seems to work. So I'm, I'm double-checking the, um, uh, the actual so, uh, workflow itself um, to, to see whether um, th there is a problem. Because there's two states, there's draft and published. Um, and 
that's the state to bring the um, item from draft to publish. So what what I'm going to do is is redefine that that workflow so that there is an approved state, um, and we can create a new draft specifically. So I'm just checking through the different states. Um, ensuring that I have the right um, the right two uh, types of state changes that are allowed to occur. So um, we can define these these two two areas more succinctly in in the the workflow itself. So um, now I'm I'm just double checking the permissions on that and making sure that the baker has the right uh, permissions to move um, between uh, between published states. Um, so I'll create a new survey transition. Both baker and chef should should get that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to hit the save on that. And hopefully, when I refresh, I, I get the all-important submit button. Um, so, now I, I'm pretty confident I have that little green submit button down the bottom. And I, I'm going to fill out the uh, the details around uh, a cupcake. And I'll, I'll hit the net. Um, just to grab another uh, studio picture of a uh, of a beautiful strawberry cupcake, um, get my uh, trusty um, screenshot tool, marquee a selection of of a cupcake with a little bit of peppermint on the top, and uh, give it a name, drop it in my images folder, and then dutifully upload that using my uh, Firefox browser. Um, that I happen to be logged in as um, the uh, baker. So I'm allocating uh, uh, alt image, uh, aligning it to the left, giving it some statistics, but you'll notice that the strawberry cupcake is in an unpublished state. Baker uh, has created it, but baker can't um, take that um, unpublished document and go further. So I'm, I'm opening incognito in Chrome, and I'm going to log in as chef and just check that workflow works. But you can see I don't actually have a listing of all of the cupcakes that are in draft. So I, I'm going to have to go back and create a view um, that shows me all of the cupcakes that are in draft only. So I'm, I'm creating a new page that represents all the batches that are in an unpublished state. And of course... Um, only um, chefs and bakers will be able to see those um, those drafts, so they won't go to um, uh, they won't go to survey. So I'm I'm changing the query a little bit, making sure that the query says that the published status is um, equal. Oops, what have I done? Yeah, the published status will be draft. So there's a, a strange little if statement that I've defined. The next um, step is to actually give it a menu. So I'm proving out that it works. Um, I have a URL, unpublished batches. I need to take that unpublished batch and, and make it into the menu. But you can see now that the uh, chef has access to unpublished um, batches list. They can change the, the workflow. So there's a, a workflow menu at the top of each one of those items. So let's create the menu item and uh, paste in the link. So I'm going to... Uh, yeah, okay. So draft batches appears in the menu system. And I should, as chef, see all the draft batches. Mm. Okay, so we've got uh, pretty much the... Um, the uh, the permission set once again um, for that user to access all of the different batch types. Um, so we're kind of wondering why there's a permission denied coming up. Uh, it doesn't 
make sense off the top of my head. Um, yeah, there's a, there's an ob a couple of objects in the permissions table there that uh, sort of um, gives you a warning saying, careful with this one, it, it seems to have too much power. So you can give users the right to access all content. It's like a little get out of jail free card. But for some reason, um, the... Okay, so the the baker doesn't have access to um, you know that's that's rather consistent. So um, the baker shouldn't be able to access drafts that they don't have control over. So um, I'm I'm searching for a permission that doesn't exist. Um, but what I'm interested in is getting the transition from unpublished to published um, using. Um, using the chef user. So I might attempt to, to log in again. Um, you can see there anonymous can access draft batches. That doesn't seem right. So I'm changing the access permissions of the view itself. So you can go into view and say, look, the person that's allowed to view this or, or the type of role that's allowed to view this is, is restricted. So, um, I noticed that anonymous users can see uh, the actual unpublished list, the view, but not actually the individual unpublished items. So it may be important for me to just change the permissions of the view separate to the permissions of, of the of the individual objects. Um, and you can you can go in and, and change it based on role. So what I'm looking at here is is the permissions of the view that are um, are related to content so um, so you can see here there's there's sort of a, a listing of all of the draft items um, but no ability to see the actual content itself so I'm having a sort of a bit of a click around and, and trying to get the permissions to work um, that's a, a user that has uh, no access whatsoever um, So we're having a look at the, the different um, options for, for batch and, and constantly sort of um, flying back to this, this permissions area to just confirm that the different um, settings that were, were set for access to batch are, are set correctly. Um, but when you find that we've talked about three things now, we've talked about access permissions to the content itself, access permissions to transition between different states of published or unpublished and also we can change permissions on the views themselves so that there's there's permission states all over the uh, the content management system it's not all a centrally located list like you see here um, you do actually have to go around the different areas of, of the content management system to manage its its different uh, different view states um, so I'm, I'm checking the the transition states to make sure that um, all of the the different content types have have the right permissions. But uh, I'm probably going to swing back to views again and, and change views by role rather than by by content type. Um, so this is the anonymous user completely anonymous. They have no access. There's a bit of a login giveaway in the top right hand corner there. Um, and uh, if you can see here, I'm, I'm in a incognito, but uh, I have logged in as, as a specific user. So I'm having a look at some of the access to died errors. The log files tend to give you a bit of an idea as to the kind of, of failing that, that has occurred. So you can get an idea for um, the different um, people, especially in production, you can get an idea for the different people that have tried to sort of penetrate your site in different ways. But logs can be useful from a debugging perspective. Um, and that's under the uh, report section of the uh, of the content management system. So just bear in mind that there's a number of ways of trying to debug. Not only is your observation in different incognito views useful, but, but also have a look at the, um, the logs that are generated. 
Um, it can be useful to sort of dig in underneath the hood and have a look at the uh, server log. Um, so the uh, MySQL logs or the Apache logs can give you some idea as to, to what's going on, especially when, when you're looking at um, 404 types or 500 types uh, of error. They can give you a, a bit, bit of a better idea for, for what, um, what might be going on. So I'm still sort of zeroing in on, on the exact reason why I'm getting an access denied when I try to view uh, a specific content. And it, it is related to the, to the view area of, of the site. And we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So um, I've, I've kind of given up permissions and I want to push forward and, and deal with, um, with a, a specific uh, area of, of what makes Drupal, in my mind, the... Um, the best content management system for building information systems and that is to create a relationship between two different content because you have your um, your uh, batches which represent the uh, the things that were baked but when you do a survey you're surveying on what you you have to sort of define from a drop down list what survey or or what your what specific cupcake batch you are um, you're surveying so I'm going in here and I'm creating a specific view called Entity Reference. And an Entity Reference view is, is a, a special type of view which only uh, shows um, things in um, other things. So I'll explain when I manage the content type called Survey. But in this particular area, I'm, I'm just going to add up uh, edit up the entity reference settings so that um, I can filter only for cupcakes that are no older than four days. So the individual shouldn't um, do a survey on a one-month-old cupcake. Or a, um, so there is a sort of a, a, a definite lifespan to the um, the cupcake that they uh, are going to uh, survey. So. What I'm saying here is I'm saying I, I don't want to list anything that's any uh, greater than than minus five days. So anything that's that's minus five days or, or less is okay. So if it's, it's more than five days, then that means that the cupcake's too moldy and, and can't, be, um, can't be surveyed upon. So I'm going to dip down here and I'm going to look for a reference. I'm going to reference a piece of content. Um, and that content is is going to be um, from from a different uh, content type. So I'm only going to limit the content to one item. So I, I don't want the user to sort of enter in two or three. And here's where I change the entity reference. So I'm going to filter by an entity reference. Um, and only show the things that um, that came from that other content type. So I'll call it batch choice, and you can see views, and I select the one view that I've created that is an entity reference. So that batch option, choose a cupcake, you just ate, um, and that uh, is is not uh, autocomplete, it should be from a select list. So now what we should see when we go incognito uh, and when we incognito not logged in, uh, one of the survey items will be what um, different uh, cupcake uh, do you want to, uh, to, to uh, survey. So I need to change the order of the field so that that batch option appears further up the list. So the first thing they're doing is choosing the batch and then they're rating and finally they're putting some comments in at the end. So I want to give uh, create new content permission for survey to the um, anonymous user. So it's an unusual situation in, in content management system terms to actually give uh, end users the right to create content on our system. But just bear in mind, the workflow that we've allocated for this is to never publish. So we're just going to make sure that um, the user can only go to from you know uh, from a state uh, that, that will stay in draft. 
So there's a draft-only transition. We're going to make sure that both the anonymous user and authenticated users can both uh, use that draft-only uh, transition. But just bear in mind that bakers and um, chefs don't really have any ability to create survey to begin with. Um, so you can see here I've got um, a new survey, the ordering seems to be correct, and I can put some comments in and then submit that that uh, that survey to the survey system. And then have a look at my content and see that anonymous, not verified, is in an un unpublished state. So, um, and the comments actually are the title of the, of the page. Just bear in mind that um, you can't delete a title of a piece of content so but you can rename its label so i've renamed re relabeled the name title to um to be comments um so i'm creating another view a final view here um and that view will um have certain permissions um and yeah, I'm, I'm sort of looking in the wrong place with regards to permissions. Um, but yeah, th there's sort of, y you can get other content to to look at that view. Um, and that that's not entirely the exact place. I'm, I'm sort of grappling at the wrong place, but you can sort of see um, that I'm, I'm sort of defining a, a, a criteria. So the published date is yes. Um, the content type is survey. So, oh, sorry, the, is, is not yes. I'm changing the view to a table so that it shows all of the content. So you'll note that bakers and chefs can view all the surveys that came in. And I'm defining that view here just to make sure that um, the those two users can see all of the different um, feedback. So what you see in this list are every single uh, field in every single content type. And I'm sort of searching uh, high and low for the pieces of information there, but it, it's quicker to use that search box up in the top left-hand corner. I can search for different content types, but I can also type in the specific content type that I'm looking for. And now the um, all of the different survey um, details are, are available. Uh, I can change the labels. I can change some of the um, the information, but I'll, I'll, I'm happy with the defaults. You can see down here, there's two surveys that have come in. So the view system will give you a, a sort of a a draft look of of its um of its uh, site. So. I can reorder things a little bit, just change the way that table looks so that batch is the first thing that comes up on the left and then the, the relative uh, responses that the user gave. Um, I want to make sure that that particular content type is only, sorry, that particular view type is only available to a, a certain role, R-O-L-E. Um, so it, it's sort of important that in, in the view system you, you define permissions as well. It's not the only place you can define permissions, but it, it's certainly one, one of, of many. So I'm creating a menu link, um, just making sure that that menu link will appear um, in the menu system. So the right user should be able to see all of the surveys that, that came through the system. And I think we're logged in uh, Chrome as a, as a chef. Um, so those are all the cupcakes that are listed. These are all of the surveys that came in. Um, and draft batches is another view that only shows the um, cupcakes that um, haven't been baked. So I can change the access restriction to roll and I should be able to define um, a certain user that only has access to that particular content type. So just bear in mind that you can create access permissions based on, on role. And if, I, if I'm completely logged out, I, I shouldn't be able to see that. Oh, that's I forgot to, to save. So I've changed the access permission to be on role. Um, I've saved that. And, and I might go into the other um, content types and, and restrict them based on a role as well um, just to make sure that um, 
people can't see draft cupcakes. Um, they can see uh, published cupcakes, but they can't see draft in in an anonymous state. So I'm filling out another survey on um, Berry Vanilla Surprise, filling out contents, hitting submit button, and the yeah the the survey then applies to um, to to that particular piece of uh, piece of content. Um, there are no unpublished batches. All batches have been published. So um, I think we've pretty much got functionality sort of locked in. There might be a couple of bits of permission here and there, um, and just sort of running through the uh, the the site one last time. We'll put in a, a, another cupcake uh, and take it through the whole um, the whole process. So I'm currently in Firefox under the Baker role and Baker should be able to create a draft um, a draft cupcake um, defining its uh, um, parameters submitting it I can then edit it or delete it if, if I see fit but I can't bring that that guy to um, to production without dropping over to the different uh, chef user and then changing his uh, his um, draft status to published. Um, I still have access denied on actually viewing different things. So anyway, so you can see Baker's created a new um, and and the chef has has then. Um, taken that to a published state. Now, I, I have a little configuration change, and I showed you at the beginning of the video where I need to uh, turn off caching for views. So um, sometimes you, you have sort of overall configurations that need to be done. But I'm just sorting batch by a certain criteria to make sure that it only shows um, the latest one, so in reverse order, not not sort of oldest to newest, but newest to oldest, um, just because you know old cupcakes won't be uh, of of interest other than the, the the newer ones that have come through. So um, yeah, so just bear in mind that it it can be a little bit of a a problem if uh, the view system doesn't keep up with our our published dates. One way to do it is to sort of just clear out the cache, and I think that's what I'm going to do here. Or, or, yeah, um, yeah. So there's sort of a, a, a few different ways of, of cleaning things up, but you know, cache cleaning doesn't fix the in, entire issue. What what you might want to do is just to turn off caching altogether in the views um, configuration area. So. What am I doing? I'm just reordering the menu system to make sure that my menu system looks more or less clean. Um, the order is, is right for anonymous users. So anonymous users can just see all the different cupcakes that were created and, and then submit a survey on one of those cupcakes. Um, I'm having a look at the, the, the different blocks. So the thing that's immediately under the menu on the search is, is the actual breadcrumbs. And I'm not really super happy with the breadcrumbs because one, they're, they're located incorrectly. I'll need to move them down a little bit. And the other is that they contain a, um, a, a, a slash instead of a, a carrot. So I'm sort of looking for a larger than sign. Um, to be allocated to, to the the breadcrumb system rather than the way it is at the moment. But what I'm doing is I'm confirming that I'm, I'm getting a, a CSS lock on the thing that, that I need to, to, to check. Now breadcrumbs can be, or, or the look and feel can be well and truly edited in CSS. Um, but of course you want to move um, the different content types, so the different blocks to their sort of relevant locations so that, that the menu lives in a menu area and the um, breadcrumbs lives just below that. So I'm, I'm just sort of reorganizing the look and feel of my site so that it, it has a, a, a decent sort of block structure. Um, so blocks are um, an interesting way of, of just defining different sort of um, pieces of content that might appear on many, many different pages. 
there is a block type for content itself. So, you know, obviously these forms and, and survey lists and views and what have you are, are still very useful um, and, and have to be there. But, but uh, things like headers and footer options are, are useful. So I'm having a little bit of a look through the, uh, the file system. There is actually a, a breadcrumb file in the Bootstrap um, components area. Um, where you can you can change some of the features, but uh, I've I've sort of realised that CSS you should probably find all of the options of CSS before you have to go in and, and maybe edit some of the um, some of the the core files that uh, that exist because um, obviously the settings themselves don't don't really or the files themselves are. are written in such a way as, as to be devoid of content. They're the templates by which we, we uh, put content in. So um, I'm more or less happy with the functionality and, and we're, we're having a bit of a play with, uh, with the look and feel of the site. Um, and you can see here that um, I'm sort of changing the way some uh, parts of the system will be uh, be set up. So this one here ensures that users can't self-register. Um, and I don't want um, you know uh, my user accounts to be gummed up with uh, you know um, users to be moderated. So uh, in the theme itself I can I can upload a file or I can refer to it and I think I had some uh, some less trouble uh, with the file type problem. So it's telling me PNG, JPEG, GIF are the only files allowed. I'm trying to, to place an SVG file. So what I might do is I might sort of just move the file that is the cupcake.svg file directly into an area of the themes folder and then refer to that file, um, you know, using, instead of a file upload, using path description so I can I can just define the path based on on the root folder of Drupal itself um, it probably shouldn't have um, a, a, a back a, a forward slash at the beginning because that refers to a an absolute position um, so just you know, everywhere else you need the forward slash but if you're defining a path through a file system, it, it makes sense not to have that um, prefixing forward slash. It's a bit weird, but fav icons and, and images, again, can be stricken by the dreaded uh, caching problem. So just bear in mind that uh, both your fav icon, it's already there. There's already a sort of a little blue alien uh, type character that um, probably won't be replaced until we sort of clear our local cache um, on the browser itself, um, or, or or it expires by its own by its own. Um. So I'm just uh, having a look at some of the features of of um, of the theme itself. So the first step is to have a look at um, the options that you have for the uh, Bootstrap theme. Uh, in just sort of giving yourself a little bit of a, a head start before you have to dive into CSS or, or the templates themselves. Um, when you have to deal with um, the, uh, the the actual file system, other than CSS, you're you're entering a zone of um, both HTML and PHP and and some things called mustaches or, or templating um, pieces that dig deep into the Drupal's own um, internal mechanisms. So I'm sort of just checking my blocks, checking my themes, making sure that I have things um, positioned correctly in, in the site overall. But you'll um, you'll find that you'll you'll play around with this quite a lot, and and there's there's ways in which you can have content um, devoid of certain menus or, or certain themes. You you can look at the content settings itself and and define what blocks you want to. To display on, on a per content basis or even a per content type basis but we we haven't sort of delved into that we've just looked at um at the overall content type so the overall uh, view of the site itself 
So I'm still fighting the breadcrumbs a little bit to try and get my uh, all important slash being changed to a um, to a, a larger than sign. And I think I, I've realized that the best way to do this is, is actually in CSS itself. And um, when you sort of right click and use the um, uh, inspector or the, the Chrome developer tools, you, you're able to sort of have a little bit of a play with um, with different uh, different pieces of content. So I've defined breadcrumb um, li before um, as a way of, of changing the uh, the actual content. And I'm not happy with the color of that. So I might change the color from gray to, to the default blue or uh, a darker gray because it, it's, it's hardly seeable. You, can, you can, can't really see it at all. So I'll change the color to um, the same gray as the others so that it has a little bit of definition. So now it looks like breadcrumbs because it sort of gave me a little bit of a confusion at some point. It, it, I wasn't sure what, what it was. And, and it's a better convention to use the Chevron-like uh, um, identifier. I'm not really happy with that line below create survey. If you can get rid of um, unnecessary uh, uh, pieces of, of, um, of layout, it, it sort of gives a bit more space to things. So again, I've right clicked on it. I've defined um, the, the, the content changes that I want and I'm just gonna change the border to zero so that um, that line just completely disappears. Um, not happy with the green color of the submit button either, so that that green colored submit button needs to be uh, needs to be changed to, to something. Um, in the uh, the theme itself, we can we can change a little bit about the menu system, not a huge amount, but if you look at um, f uh, the nav bar, you can inverse the color of the nav bar. And change the layout to be either absolute or fixed, but we will keep that in flow. So now that's reversed the color, and it's, it's sort of reversed the color to a way that that suits um, my my liking a little bit. But instead of an ugly black, I'm I'm going to go with a, another tone of blue. So I'm pacing pasting in what I found in the developer tools. I'm going to give. Uh, not navy blue. I'm checking the uh, the color names, and it'll be a dark blue or something along those lines. Um, so I'll change the navy blue to midnight blue, and then check the uh, the layout. So now we have um, the the midnight blue color, but the menu items don't don't get that all important midnight blue. So again, I'm I'm looking at the stylings in the developer tools on the right, and then choosing extra selectors to be applied or to get the the different color uh, colors to be applied. Um, and sometimes it's a bit hit and miss. You end up sort of maybe adding too many um, too many options to to the uh, to the uh, to the styling area. So this one here was particularly difficult, but eventually I worked it out, and I'll work it out in the next sort of fifteen minutes. Note that this um, particular part of the video is all styling. Um, so we're currently sitting at uh, um, you know a two-hour video. Um, and we're sort of in the last sort of quarter, last fifth of the video, but everything that I do here will be related to um, to layout. So we're, we're specifically playing with Bootstrap here and trying to get Bootstrap to, to show an indigo color for the selected menu item. And we'll, we'll eventually get there, but we're, we're going around in circles for the moment. You'll note that I'll head off in a whole lot of different directions before coming back to this. Um, so, so for those users that um, just wanted to see the Drupal side of things and not the um, the Bootstrap side of things, it, it might be useful to sort of skip ahead towards the end of the video where I, I talk about um, uh, backing up the site um, because we want to dump the database and we want to zip up all of the materials that we've done and potentially put into production. 
the concern obviously is that in a production environment you'd re you'd redefine the passwords from password to something a little bit stronger you'd also define the database password if you remember right back in the installation stage that database password was nothing it, it will need to be allocated as well so um as far as CSS goes, I'm, I'm sort of defining all of the, the colors of, of midnight blue to be um, in uh, different parts of the site. So there's a difference between a comma in CSS and a space. Um, the comma means uh, we're, we're comma delimiting different selectors, whereas the space means to select the child of the parent. So you'll find that some of these stylings will go haywire if you don't have the comma. Um, so, yeah, as I sort of, you know, clean up footer and header and menu and, and what have you, you'll, you'll find that they'll all sort of have um, a light blue, midnight blue kind of contrast. So I'll be eradicating black from the, uh, black and white from the site and, and just, just using um, the blues uh, and and the one highlight color, which is that, um, that uh, olive color that uh, that in the title. So as far as Drupal is concerned, it does use um, it does use Bootstrap in a uh, in a in in the um, in the most sort of um, clean way possible. You can define. Um, the classes that Bootstrap understands to to do your layout. So uh, the, the the difficulty is that if, if you wanted to sort of define a different layout, you you have to leave CSS because CSS by itself was, is only going to give you the characteristics of the styling, not the um, not the actual sort of uh, dimension or the um, the layout. And, and for that, um, I, I'm going to make one change, and that is to sort of um, allow the content um, below the header and above the footer to sit more central, because at the moment it takes up 100% of the screen, and, and for desktop viewing, that, that's just not, not acceptable. So we will change templates, um, and I'll note it in the, um, in the headings. And, and put it in the table of contents for you. So have a look below this video under the table of contents, and I'll I'll have a, a little a little discussion about um, about templating because I only change one thing. Um, so I'm I'm continuing to add more and more um, selectors to try and sort of attach this this one active menu. And and just bear in mind that um, developer tools are your friends. So look very closely at the selector that that is being uh, found when you're um when you're uh, looking at, uh, at at different parts so the trick that i'm tending to find is i'm right clicking i'm inspecting element and the, the inspect element gives me a, a few features that um i wouldn't normally get now you'll note here that i've got uh active that um that color, where is it, indigo, uh, being used incorrectly. So I've defined or I've, I've, I've captured the active uh, element, which hasn't worked out for my menu, but it's worked out for the active um, element in the uh, breadcrumbs list. So I'm going to have to sort of define active to be a part of a different area. So active in the nav bar or active in the header or active in the nav itself. So I'm, I'm trying my hardest to, um, to define all the different nav related areas that need to get the midnight blue. So all the nav areas and the active ones to get the indigo. So I'm, I'm going around in circles a little bit trying to, to, um, to, to get the styling right. But, uh, um, it, it's, it's taking a while. Those, those people that, that are, are very used to Bootstrap are probably, you know, smashing the table at the moment saying, do this, do this. Um, but obviously, um, there's, there's sort of like a, a little bit of debugging in, in the process. I'm not entirely, and I didn't really get to it either, um, fixing up the, the menus themselves, so the forms themselves. You can see the form takes up 100% of the width of the screen, which is perfect in a mobile view, but it's it's not acceptable in a desktop environment. 
In fact, the comments area down the bottom, I tried to push the size up a lot so that the size of comments could t could take up more room. But that, that wasn't, wasn't uh, acceptable either. Um, and it has something to do with um, the theme more than anything else. So um, Bootstrap has, has taken uh, input and has given it a size. So in some ways we'd have to sort of like put size none in, in the CSS or, or the size. You know, to try to sort of like clear out size to, to make sure each one of those form fields takes up a different a different area. So I'm still having a hack, and I've, I've managed to find um, some code from um, from uh, the the developer tools that might be a little bit more useful. So um, I'm, I'm sort of locking on to the hover and the focus um, so that it too can get the same indigo color that the other um, items have. So um, actually, I'm, that little login down the bottom is is the thing that's sort of sort of getting me. So I'm sort of defining nav nav li, um, and then finally getting a color in there. And that uh, carrot, that larger than sign, means um, that you want to apply the stylings to um, the child of the parent. So nav is the parent, li is the child. Please style the child. Um, I'm a bit annoyed by that and it, it's because the active doesn't, hasn't been um, been parented. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to make sure that only um, the active in the navigation system is is uh, is dealt with, not the active in the breadcrumb system. So, um, so ho hover is when your mouse goes over. Focus is when your mouse goes down. So you can style on on mouse uh, mouse down, um, and by consequence mouse up, um, which is hover or or, or the default. Um, so. <laughs> I'm going to bootstrap.org, but obviously the wrong bootstrap.org. Um, just to sort of get a little bit of a um, inspiration from other layouts that sort of exist in in uh, in the web, and I, I want to just sort of get my design centered a little bit, um, and that that sort of content area, at least in desktop view, needs to be sort of compressed down. And adding an extra class or redefining an extra class in content is is absolutely necessary. And in order to do this, I'm going to have to um, grab the the right template, the the content template. But at this moment in time, I'm I'm trying to be inspired by different uh, different Bootstrap sites, none of which truly give me the information I'm looking for. Text Center, Jumbotron. That's that's not sort of something that I want. Um, I'm pretty sure a Jumbotron is, is a specific type of um, of masthead that uh, might sort of cycle through a number of different different images on a timer. But um, I'm sort of going to the uh, all-knowing oracle of uh, everything web-related and I'll try center-block but uh, I'm, it might just be center all by itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip into Bootstrap proper, so the Bootstrap that we downloaded, into templates. And I'm going to copy um, the one template that contains the uh, width of 12 in my content area and drop him down to 8 or 9 so that um, he doesn't take up as much room. And you can see here that um, the TWIG files are... Um, or what uh, or what contains these templates, and you can see here there's there's sort of a, a little bit of a um, a design ethos here. So there's some if statements. So whenever you see the little question mark, um, you know there's sort of a, a a a binary choice that's made given a certain um, type of uh, event. So what I'm trying to do is is to change the content width to use up a little bit less space in desktop view. Um, 
but I've gotten sidetracked because I've gone and styled the um, the, the menus themselves. So that's not centered. That's brought it to um, to the left, and that obviously that advice on Stack Overflow wasn't wasn't that useful. I'm continuing to read different um, comments, um, but I, all I'm doing is looking for the class. Um, that will give me what I'm looking for. Um, and center block didn't work, so I'm sort of giving up on that. Um, and I'm going to try a different a different styling. Um, yeah, so center a column using Bootstrap and row centered. Um, Text align center, text center. So it might actually be okay if I use um, if I use uh, some kind of CSS to try and sort of center it up, um, which might be sort of the the best option um, is maybe to define a six or an eight, and then put the word centered in at the end. Okay, so I've I've changed that, but just bear in mind again, whenever you're changing templates, um, you might have a little bit of a problem with the Drupal caching system. So, okay, so <laughs> I've put my own my own um, styling in. So I followed someone's advice, and I've changed the. Uh, um, I've just added an extra class, a user-defined class to, to define centered, which which is your margin zero auto type type solution. Um, fine and dandy. I mean that that's one way of doing it. It would be nice if if we could get um, if we could get Bootstrap to do it, but you know that that's a, a little bit of a cheaty way. So I'll change that to eight and give myself a little bit more room. I'm clearing cache as as time goes on, just just to sort of get. Um, get the uh, the site to um, update its changes. So the the uh, the layout's looking more uh, more better, -er, but these uh, edits um, windows have been styled incorrectly. I I, I want to try and eradicate white, and in fact, when I'm not in header and or footer, I I don't want to see that sort of um, that dark blue uh, at all. Um, so I'm going to sort of find the selector that um, is related to this and then just sort of uh, remove it from my um, my area because you can see um, some of that is um, nav related. So if you look at the top of that, the list items, I've gone and um, defined nav list item and, and that's what's sort of firing off this stuff here, which isn't perfect um, my preference is that this nav stuff um, doesn't apply to revert um, drafts or, or change uh, content or edit content so I'm, I'm looking to try and sort of just make sure that um, I'm only applying um, you know the uh, the, the different uh, midnight blue and um, purplish colors to um, to the header and footer. Um, and there may be a, just a little bit of iterative sort of debugging going on to try and sort of clean that up. Yeah, so I'm just defining the nav bar footer. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether that that's sort of gonna gonna work. In fact, I'm probably gonna go backwards a little bit when that happens. Um, I've decided to go on and sort of clean up these buttons because the the buttons themselves sh shouldn't be uh, a separate color. So I'm finding um, where a button is being used. Uh, and then defining a, um, a color for button and taking the um, the midnight blue color and the white color and then allocating. Oops, that was because footer was used there and shouldn't have been. Um, so yeah, that login form um, 
needs to have a, a, a different a different uh, value allocated to it. Um, so now the hover of of that item is isn't quite right. So I'm gonna gonna change the button hover to have the indigo color, I suppose. Um, nav active and so now it, it sort of gets a, a different color so it's got the midnight blue and now it's got the indigo but now the uh, when you click it it has the green so I've got to change the um, the hover and, and the active but I want to kill the button icon I don't want the check mark so I'll, I'll get rid of the actual little picture that's on the left hand side of that that image um, and just get rid of it all together um, notice that uh, Bootstrap just uses classes everywhere, so, so never forget the prefixing dot um, that defines all of the um, the different Bootstrap-related elements. Um, so if you see class being used, make sure you have a dot in the CSS. Um, Okay, yeah, I'm just having a play, making sure that all of the different um, uh, mouse over effects get the the um, the, the right color. Um, so I'm just adding more selectors and comma delimiting those selectors as as I go along. Um, so I've I've used a combination of background color and background and and. Background is is the more generic or the more general term. Um, and that might not be the uh, the, the perfect uh, the perfect solution in your case. So I think I finally uh, um, hooked on to the right um, indigo color to define the um, yeah the, the right hovering on the different menu items. Um, but I'm not sure whether the selected one has been found yet. Um, so notice that I'm starting to define the areas, body, nav, header, footer, where these selectors are going to take place. Um, and I'm sort of forcing the um, the styling to just, just uh, f uh, work in, in one specific area. So I'm, I'm reducing the effect that occurs. So if you remember, indigo started appearing in the... Um, in the breadcrumbs area, and um, it appears in the um, in the content control areas above content items. So, if if we we end up sort of just defining how the nav bars are, are being affected, um, we're we're potentially just reducing the effect that it has on on the outer areas. But of course, I'm going backwards a little bit. Um, should have defined that at the beginning, but we'll. We'll get there. Um, so I'm just trying under different users, and and sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards, and that's just the way it is. But we we notice that the um, the the breadcrumbs don't have that indigo color on them anymore. So we've we've sort of gone forward in that respect. Um, but it might be useful. Just bear in mind that oh, I'm, I'm coming to the discovery as well that, that it's, it's really useful to look at your developer tools, identify the selectors that are being affected in the areas, and then paste them into your overriding uh, area. Um, so I can just define footer as a whole to contain that one color. And then the menu bar nav and the um, active and the hover can can get their their, their alternative colors. Um, so I should be able to take all the footer related stuff out of this selector um, and do the same as what I did with footer and just define the header and nothing else um, to get that blue color. But n note that. Um, in that login area, the forget your reset your password area, we, we need to get that color out. Um, it's not technically a button and it's not technically a header or a footer. So we're, we're going to sort of um, just be more um, specific about our selectors. Um, so 
So I'm looking for, for where um, that incorrect uh, styling is being applied and then just saying make it header, make it a part of the header system um, and then suddenly things disappear but uh, obviously the active uh, is appearing so I'll add header to these areas here and now suddenly we've, we've got a little bit of a change. I don't like login being white, and I want to override the background color of, of that active to, to be nothing, so I'll eventually work that one through as well. Um, mm. Yeah, so oh, I'm looking for another color to add to my um, my repertoire, which is sky blue, to, to replace those white and those gray colors. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting back here, I'm having sort of misgivings about doing that now because sky blue just inter introduces another color. But I mean, you've got, um, you know, midnight, blue and indigo as two separate colors why can't you have sky blue and light blue as as two colors as well so you know there's there's sort of pros and cons around all of it especially when i've used olive in h1 so um olive does actually stand out quite nicely but uh maybe not with sky blue and light blue together so i'm sort of you know just just in hindsight i'm probably you know, not not super uh, I'm super happy with it, but you know, it'll do. So that login needs to be given a sky blue color. So again, I'm looking at the um, selectors. So just make sure you look in styles below and grab the selectors that are being um, that are be being affected um, and. I'm trying to grab, excuse me, trying to grab the uh, the white color, and I'm looking down the bottom where the actual styles are, are explained to me, and then trying to copy out that selector and, and paste it into my um, into my layout. There we go. There's a there's a strange little sort of halo around it as well. I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. But, um, yeah, it kind of looks like most of the styling is done. Um, I, I, I'm pretty happy at this point in time that, you know, most of the, uh, the look and feel has been, um, has been defined. Um, and I should probably go through and change all of the hovers to have actives as well, just so that, you know, the mouse down event is, is dealt with correctly. There's still that ugly black on survey, and, and I think I've finally, the pennies dropped, and I need to go down to what style is being affected, um, and then simply paste in the exact style that's being affected, because I'm going all over the joint with um, trying to, to sort of get a finger on this little black area here. Because um, at the moment, it, it's trying to, to go indigo and light blue. But it, it's not, it's not going to work. So I'm trying to be inspired by the other other searches that I found. But in the end, I, I go to the developer tools and and just paste out the the exact um, styling or the exact selector that that's going to be applied. But what's happened with um, nav tabs and what's happened with uh, footer uh, needs to happen in in the header area so yeah this this is a sort of a, a fool's errand a folly that didn't work um, because it, it it doesn't um, oops it doesn't apply uh, correctly. So I'll drop my indigo in there, test it out, and nah, it doesn't work. 
So that that was a sort of an incorrect checking the syntax, making sure there's col uh, commas where they should be, but it's 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 not going to work. Um, but a active is is certainly one of the one of the things that we're interested in. But in the end, I click on the um, on the active list item and then sort of work through the styles that are related to that. Um, So there's the style. No, that's not it. So the the li class active is is the element that we're looking for. Um, yeah, um, so there it is. And navbar inverse navbar nav active a. That's quite a mouthful of selectors there that are being applied, but I'm just going to paste them straight in. Navbar inverse navbar nav active. Well, and there it is. So the ultimate answer is is to uh, trust in your uh, developer tools and 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 find the selector that way. Um, trying to second guess can be a little bit different, especially with the um, with the kinds of uh, of things that um, are, are dealt with by Drupal itself. So that active is is something that's allocated not in styling but but in functionality. So what I'm doing here now is I'm I'm turning on aggregation and I'm I'm sort of clearing my caches. Um, and setting cache limit to about 30 minutes, just sort of in the assumption that it'll, it will go to a production environment. I'm taking the site offline, and I'm going to go through the process of um, zipping that sucker up and, and sort of compressing it down so that it uh, it then um, uh, is, is backed up. Because my interest is in making sure that we... Um, we can not only take to production, but we have a sort of a copy of our site that uh, represents the work that we've done today. You might have seen uh, two hours of it, but I, I certainly spent a little bit more time. So the first thing we've got to do is is to, um, well, we'll get rid of the old backup, uh, go into Drupal, get rid of the SQL file that was there. So I'll just remove out the Drupal SQL, then I'll dump um, MySQL dump out the um, the new version of the database or the current version of the database. Um, that's the wrong command. I've got to put MySQL dump in there. So you watch. I'll, I'll sort of recover my confusion as to why MySQL isn't starting up. I just put the word dump the U M P, and of course it's going weird because it's a video. Um, so I'll do that again from the start, MySQL dump, uh, no password required, Drupal is our database, and then pipe that out to, or redirect that out to Drupal.sql. Check that there's some stuff in there, and that's pure SQL, and now I'm going to go through the process of, of compressing and, and creating an archive. So I'll name the archive cupcake drupal.tar.gz, and then I'll say, this is the folder that I want to compress. 